Welcome back everyone. Today I want to talk about video editing as a general topic and then get a little bit into the weeds on a few of the more regular questions that I see and get asked about how big of a CPU do you need, how much storage do you need, etc, etc. So the first thing I want to do is just talk about what we use at Pocketables. Uh, personally, I use Shotcut, which is a free open source video editor built on the MLT framework. Other video editors are built on that same framework, uh, Caden Live being an excellent example. Uh, but Shotcut is the project of the MLT framework maintainer. And in my experience, is both stable and fast and portable. Um, I can run it without installing it. It runs on Windows, OS X, and Linux. Uh, no Android port yet, although with the new M1 Max, I believe it's been ported to that already. So maybe I'll get a version that runs on an Android tablet one day, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, real work, at least for me, still happens on PCs. So I use Shotcut. Shotcut's a pretty fully featured editor, um, comparable to, although not quite uh, the same as Adobe Premiere. There's a couple of features that were either, um, how do I want to phrase this? Not as important to his audience that took longer to show up, proxies being a good one. In fact, um, I'm going to go ahead and tell it to start generating proxies now because that's something that I want Helps if I have the correct hardware encoder enabled. Um, anyway, proxies help, especially when you're editing at 4K on a lower end system by generating a lower resolution duplicate of the file that you imported as your source. Um, in the case of Shotcut, it defaults to 540p, and I don't think I can change that for proxies, but honestly, it's good enough. You also have things like resolution scaling inside the UI where you can say only render it at 720 instead of 4K. Both of those can be used to speed up your workflow. And both of those are examples of features that showed up in things like Adobe Premiere first and then made their way to Shotcut due to the constraints of having, you know, a handful of open source developers. Um, but there's other features that were here first, like... Uh, I can export larger than 4K video, and I think you can do that in Adobe Premiere now, but I looked for a long time back in 2016, I needed to edit something that I think worked out to 5K, because I didn't want it rescaled on the monitor array it was running on in real time, I just wanted it to be what it was, and uh, Shotcut was actually a great one when I found it, because I was able to say, here's what I want to do on the forum because it couldn't before and the answer from the developer was well the engine can it's just a text field limitation I'll fix it in the next release and he did um, so shout out to Dan on that so anyway we use Shotcut um, I think I'm using 2927 because I had some issues with some changes that have happened in some of the recent ones but that's neither here nor there it's still available all the way back to, I think, some of the 2012 versions. Um, maybe even earlier than that. It's been a while since I went to dig up old copies. But anyway, so I use Shotcut. This is what I use. It edits 4K nicely. Uh, most of our videos on YouTube you'll see have a Made With Shotcut uh, tag, if I remember to tag the video. And if I don't, just give me a nudge in the comments and I'll go fix that. Same thing for if I say something's in the description and I forget to link it. Just tell me and I'll add it. Anyway, um, so that covers the software side. What do you need for video editing? Well, you need a nonlinear video editor. Shotcut's a good example that's free. OpenShot's another one. Kden Live I mentioned is another popular one. Obviously, you've got Adobe After Effects. I want to say Cinema 4D is one. DaVinci Resolve is fairly popular, and all of those come with their own ups and downs. A uh, big one that I want to talk about is actually hardware support. So part of what I like about Shotcut is that it's fairly open and flexible with its hardware support. 
unlike some of the other ones, especially the more professional ones, used to require that you have a certain class of graphics card in order to edit or in order to enable certain levels of hardware acceleration. And we're going to get to why that hardware acceleration matters in a minute. Um, but Shotcut doesn't really care. If you have a GPU with NVEC, it can use NVEC. If you have a IGP, it can use Intel's QuickSync, um, and it can use, what is it, AMD's AMF, although I'm not particularly, uh, what's the word I want to use here, familiar with AMF, personally, I just haven't, but, so hardware support matters, you need to have the right hardware for your editor and you need to have the right hardware on your edit system. Um, storage is a part of that. You want as much fast storage as you need and as you can get, basically. And how much you need is wildly variable based on what you're shooting. Uh, my Zcam E1 here is a good example. And I'll just grab one of the segments out of here. It generates files that are about two gigs a piece for every five minutes of footage I record. Well, that means that if I record a one hour video, I have 30, 12, two gig segments. I have 24 gigabytes worth of video. That's before I generate any proxies or do anything else to them and not counting for, I'm going to need somewhere that that gets exported to. And that's actually on the lower end of I'm going to say prosumer grade 4K cameras. Um, some of your other cameras will, will run in bit rates of 100 megabit to 200 megabit per second. Um, that's some of Panasonic's entry level pro grade cameras. You can get, you know, at this point, you know, 8K Cinema Red cameras that will shoot things like ProRes and just eat as much storage as you can. We're talking gigabytes per minute on some of those if you're shooting Cinema Raw of some sort. So storage is something you need to consider. How big is your typical project? How much space is your camera using per minute? And how many projects are you doing? If you're going to edit one project, do it and be done, well, whatever storage you have on your system is probably fine. If you're like me, I have a dedicated one terabyte NVMe stick that I use to hold these projects while I'm editing so that I can hold a handful of them plus ancillary material, B-roll footage, um, my pre-generated intro and outro clips and all of those associated things. I can get 10 or so projects on that without too much fuss, especially since some of them may have footage from this camera as well as one or more of my b-roll cameras which i have to replace because these things are another part of that equation these are only 1080p they don't shoot any particularly high bit rate um, i can get days worth of footage on them the way i use them on like a 32 or 64 gig sd card but they are terrible for encode and decode. These shoot AVCHD, which is a format that is terrible as far as being able to encode. It's a single threaded process to do so, and therefore a CPU like my actual edit workstation is suboptimal where I have two 8-core Xeons that only run at 3.7 gigahertz compared to a modern i5 that'll run at 4 plus well if it's only using one CPU core slightly newer architecture 4 plus gigahertz clock rate it's gonna handle footage out of this better H.264 is a bit more flexible especially based on how many tracks you get in the editor um, that can go either way. Typically, I'm going to tell people for editing they do want uh, an i5 of some sort, and we'll get to part of why in a minute. 
technically these days you could do most of this on an i3 as long as you don't have any fancy uh, video effects. If most of your footage is I'm going to chop it, put it in a couple of tracks, maybe I'm going to zoom, or not zoom, maybe I'm going to uh, speed up some of it and do some basic filters, maybe I'm going to key something. Well, we're going to see that a modern i3, which is as capable as a 7th gen i5 would have been, is actually not a bad place to be. And I mentioned storage, and I actually want to talk about storage again, because for this particular chart that I generated, I used these two drives, this HyperX and this Mushkin Carbon X, attached via USB 3.0 to every single system. I ran five different systems, CPU and GPU, to give me a couple of data points so I can talk about where and when to use GPU encoding and what its weaknesses and advantages are and what GPUs you really want to look for. So with that said, let's get to what we've been leading up to for about 10 minutes, and that is this chart, which has a lot of data on it, but let's start with, except for the oldest one of the bunch, an Intel HD 4400, every GPU that I tested came in under 26 minutes, which was my fastest CPU time. The HD Graphics 630 on my old test bench actually performed better, and I think I may have accidentally attached one of these drives to a USB 3.1 Gen 2 whatever they want to call it, a USB 3.10 gig port, by mistake. Um, and that gave it a slight advantage even over the newer HD graphics. However, there was also a cost there, and we'll get to that once we're past just the time numbers. So everything fell in line more or less with where I expected it to. Um, the HD graphics 750 is actually more advanced and newer than the 1650 from NVIDIA, came in at 22.25 minutes, or sorry, 22 minutes, 25 seconds, the 1650 came 22 minutes, 43 seconds, about where I expected them to be. The Quadro M1000M, 24 minutes, 59 seconds, and my RTX 4000, which is technically the second newest and most advanced here, came in at 25 minutes and 33 seconds. And the reason for that, I mentioned I attached these via USB. I also mentioned that that was on a CPU set that didn't clock as high as, say, the 11600K. So there's two components, or there's two variables there that I really just don't have a good way to uh, eliminate. Uh, number one is video encoding still requires you keep the GPU fed. You've got to get data to it as quickly as possible. A faster CPU is capable of getting data to the graphics card faster. In fact, I'll throw a link here where Linus Tech Tips basically learned exactly what I just demonstrated, was that they went through and took a Intel Extreme Edition and went and replaced it with a huge Xeon and found out it actually slowed down their GPU encoding because it took more time to get data into the GPU. The other side of that equation, my workstation's USB 3 chipset is not as advanced as any of the others, save for I think it is more advanced than the 53s. Um, everybody's got a newer and slightly higher end USB 3 chipset, efficiencies there, plus it relies on an external chip. There's no USB 3.0 like in the chipset itself for a pair of E5 Xeons like that, whereas on everything else that is provided by the chipset, um, except for, like I said, I don't think the 53s was chipset direct. It's just one more hop to get to and from your data. So getting the data to the device happens both at the drive level and the CPU level. Okay, neat. So GPUs are fast, faster than our fastest CPU. And the CPUs aren't, at least for the modern ones, 
that far behind or that terrible. The 2667 V2s came in at 26 minutes 33 seconds. The 11600K, 26 minutes 53 seconds. Those two are diametric opposites for how to achieve that same result. I have 16 cores at 3.7 gigahertz versus, well, six cores at four point something. I forget what the turbo is exactly on an 11600K. I'll put it on the screen. Functionally, they're both a valid approach and they're both gonna have different strengths. Remember this AVCHD that I said was terrible to edit? It's going to perform better on my 11600K than it does on the system I actually use to edit video. The H.264 that I shoot in this thing all day, that I'll shoot slow motion or B-roll with my phone some days, that my other mirrorless camera will shoot, well, more cores, more gigahertz, either way, it doesn't care. And as I add more video tracks inside the nonlinear editor, the 2667s are going to outperform the 11600K there. Um, older CPUs, our last 10th bench is 7600K, 43 minutes, not great, not terrible. Does highlight a trend though. When the CPU, or what, when you're basically not bound by storage bandwidth, which is where I think the 11600K and the 2667 were, is the CPUs were just so fast that it didn't matter how we were encoding, it was the storage that was our bottleneck, getting data to and from RAM and the CPU. Because uh, those both turned in about the same time, and frankly, they're both only a, a minute or two behind their GPU counterparts. Um, where that's not the case, the GPU encoding is at least twice as fast as the CPU. The 7600K is 43 minutes. The HD Graphics 630 was 18. My 6700HQ, which is a big laptop chip, big quad-core laptop, was 55 minutes. And the M1000M, which is the GPU in it, 24 minutes. And that still holds true on our ancient Generation 3 CF53. The i5 4310U, two, minute, or two hours, 32 minutes, and 7 seconds, versus an hour and 16 minutes and 31 seconds for an Intel HD 4400. So, that's neat. That gives us a bit of information. Number one is that Intel's HD graphics are a hidden gem for productivity. We pick on them all the time for what they can't do and what frame rates they're terrible at for gaming. But when it comes to productivity, to see a UHD 630 and 750 both hang in with three of NVIDIA's latest GPUs, basically. I mean... I have a Maxwell encoder in there in the M1000M. I have a Pascal level encoder in there in the 1650. The 1650 didn't get the new Turing encoder. I have a Turing encoder in the RTX 4000. And, well, unfortunately, I don't have a grand to go sync on any sort of 3000 series Ampere card this week. Uh, if anyone wants to send me one, <laughs> I know you don't, but... I have to ask. <laughs> um, you know what? The Intel HD graphics is doing great. And that's encouraging for Intel's new GPU line. To see that they already have the productivity part basically sorted out is fantastic. And to fact of matter, OBS is recording my screen right now at 1440p60. And that is putting a 50% load on the Intel HD graphics, which is mostly just 50% 3D, 20% video decode. Um, hidden, I guess secret, not really secret, but just big thing that Intel's IGPs have been used for for a long time is real-time video transcode. 
Um, they have been building these weird PCIe cards. I'll put a picture of one up. That would have like three E3 series Xeons, which were just consumer chips with ECC memory support. To do real-time video transcode, I think they called it a VCA. And one of the first things that they demoed with their new dedicated um, IGPs, or not IGPs, dedicated GPUs, their, their Z graphics, was a card that had four Z GPUs on it that was supposed to go in servers for real-time transcode. They're great at it. NVIDIA's are too. <laughs> I mean... That RTX 4000 can handle a ridiculous amount of real-time transcodes. But anyway, I, I digress. Um, we, we can talk about all the weird stuff that happens in the server world at some other point. There is a trade-off for all that efficiency, though. If you look, you'll notice that all of my CPUs generated a file size that was plus or minus one megabyte from the other, which uh, something like that could be size on disk errors, um, you know, a variety of things can throw a video stream off by about a megabyte. But those are all close enough that I would be willing to say that those are all going to look exactly the same in playback. And they all came in at 1.79 gigabytes. Doesn't matter if it was the 4310 or the 6700 or the 7600, my E5s, everybody came in at just about 1.79 gigabytes plus or minus a rounding order or rounding error. The GPUs though are all over the board. The smallest was the HD 630 at 583 megabytes. The largest was the old quad, well, was actually the Pascal encoder at 2.3 gigabytes. And there are a couple of reasons for this. I used the same shot cut version for all of these exports. I mentioned I used 20.9.27. Given the same data, running the same CPU data path, and maybe that's where some of these changes come from. I think the 11600K might have uh, AVX 512, the 5s have AVX, the 7600 might have a slightly uh, an SSE version in between the two, etc. Um, but running the same code path generates the same file each and every time. And with the GPUs, because I changed between a, a 4400 and a 630 and a 750 and three different NVIDIA versions, I'm at the mercy of the GPU driver and the hardware on the GPU as to how it wants to handle the data it's given. Uh, early QuickSync chips really didn't care about quality. They cared about just getting it transcoded. Didn't matter. Make it small, because we're going to transcode it and put it on a phone. Later, QuickSync chips, an Intel's encoder, did start to prioritize quality. And if you see one of our news roundups, that was actually recorded on a camera like this one, using a HD 4400 level IGP in OBS to do a real-time record and live key even. NVIDIA has made the same changes. So NVIDIA, however, tended to target quality over file size initially. And that was one of the big deals that came around with Turing was that the new encoder was much more efficient at space utilization than the previous generations. So. The M1000M, the 1650, the RTX 4000, all would do fine using NVEC to handle streaming. What they would end up with, however, is wildly different bit rates to achieve the same visual quality. And that's fine. The newer stuff gets more efficient, and 
but it does bring up the point of why I'm talking about this. It used to be, if you were working with other video editors, you always used CPU export. It didn't matter if your GPU was faster, you used the CPU export because that guaranteed that your footage was comparable to their footage. Today, that particular thing has kind of gone by the wayside, but it does still bear mentioning that you're going to get a different file and quality out of CPU versus GPU. I tend to use CPU encoding because, well, quite frankly, it doesn't cost me that much time on the 2667s. Oh, if I was editing on my 6700HQ all the time, well, if the larger file size wasn't an issue, I might take the Quadro and use it. So what do I care if it takes an extra two minutes to ex uh, upload to YouTube? It saved me ten times that much exporting. So that's worth mentioning. Um, there are some other variables there. Certain GPUs aren't going to support things like H.265. In fact, the wiki page for QuickSync, which has a feature table, depending on what IGP you get, dictates what you can decode and encode. Obviously, the latest Tiger Rocket Alder Lake, which is what we have in here, has the largest feature set. But if we, um, oh, let's pick on, so here's Coffee Lake, Cavi Lake, which is my 6700HQ. So I can generate AVC, which is H264, no problem at level 5.1. And I can generate HEVC at level 5.1 and 10 bit. If I go back a little, say Ivy Bridge and Haswell, which would be that 4000 series chip, H.264, sure, I can do that. Anything else? Nope. And there are other things to consider. Like here's Apollo Lake, which is an interesting one. Apollo Lake is the graphics level or Apollo Lake is the chips that was in some of our mini PCs. This one right here, this Byte 3, is an Apollo Lake system. And it actually turned in some decent results when I used it for encoding, when I reviewed it, because I was able to use QuickSync to handle H.264 and H.265 export. But I couldn't do... 10-bit H.265, nor would I want to on something like that, although it could decode an 8K stream. Um, so that, and the reason I mention this is that the reason that you would pick one GPU over another is as much a function of time like we talked about here, as it is a function of efficiency and just general support. Uh, I don't think Maxwell supports HEVC at all. And I'll double check that because NVIDIA has a chart just like this one. But when it comes down to it, if I want to export using H.265, I would either have to fall back to the CPU or use a different system altogether with a graphics card that can handle it. All right, for anyone who skipped ahead, I know we've rambled for a lot. I'm going to cut some of this down. I'm already at 30 minutes about a topic that should have been a lot quicker. The long and short of it, if it is, Pocketable uses Shotcut, which is cool. Check it out. For the age-old question of how big of a CPU do I need? Frankly, it depends on how much editing you want to do. But I would tell you 
generally, if you can utilize the IGP, you know what? Something like an i5 11600 and 11600K is probably going to be a fantastic option. Anything with that UHD 750 did a great job in my encoding tests. I mean, that was comparable to this 1650 in time. If you are looking towards older systems, I'm gonna tell you not to go older than Cabby Lake if you're going to leverage the IGP. Anything older than that, you're not gonna get HEVC 10-bit encode. And honestly, the CPUs just aren't as good. Cabby Lake turned in a decent time result at 55 minutes, or sorry, at 43 minutes for a 7600K. Um, but that doesn't hold a candle to a dual E5Z on system or my new 11600K. Now, if you're going with a dedicated graphics card, I'm going to tell you to check your vendor's support. And if you're working with multiple people, I'm going to warn you that you probably just want to use the CPU. I know it's tempting to go with the faster times, but this consistency here on what the CPU's file sizes were is going to mean consistent results in a large group of people. And typically by the time you're working with multiple people, you're making more than a few pennies a month or whatnot on YouTube. You're actually in a large production company. All right. Um, so I hope anybody was able to follow that. I'm sorry if this is too rambly. If anyone has any questions, don't hesitate to ask in the comments below. I'm more than happy to answer them. And uh, overall, have fun. I'm more than happy to answer questions about video editing. I want to thank anyone who helps support Pocketables either on Patreon or via Amazon Affiliate. It is support like that that helps make videos like this possible. I want to thank Electrix for providing our opening and closing themes as always. And finally, thank you for watching.